Chapter six, we're gonna start getting to the fun stuff. Well, more fun stuff. Chapter six now goes to the animal soul, Nevesha Bahamas. And it's not just that, it also goes into Klippa and Sitracha. So until now, we've been talking about all the holy stuff, the Nevesha El Kiss, Kedusha, and the garments and the thaw, about everything that's that's in the holy realm. And now we have to look at what the other part of ourselves. So much stuff that comes up where I was like, oh, we'll deal with that, we'll deal with that. Well, because that's part of this being the building block chapters, the foundational chapters. Giving us all the terms, telling us what all the terms mean, kind of see how these all function. A lot of these things get multiple chapters in discussion. That's the rest of these 53 chapters of time. We're going to go into that. I'm saying that specifically now because chapter six, seven, and eight, we might not have all the answers here yet, but we'll get more answers in seven and eight to see kind of what the point that's being made and what we're building toward. But then also a lot of these things are going to be dealt with more. With that lovely introduction, let's start. Chapter six starts with a very important important kind of statement. Vine zel umaze asalakim. Zel umaze, this opposite this. Well, as a general rule for creation of the world, but the makeup of the godly soul with the three intellectual faculties or cognitive, the seven emotive faculties, the soul powers, faculty soul powers, the animal soul has the same thing. It has the same three intellectual capacities and the same seven emotive capacities. So the structurally, they look the exact same. Now, shortcut, what's the difference in practice is that in the godly soul, mind rules over matter, intellect over emotions. And in the animal soul, intellect and emotions are kind of more level. That's part of the battle is that the emotions or the motive faculties will often overrule the intellectual, cognitive faculties. Part of where like instinct, just self-satisfaction and pleasure and things like that come in. This is what I want. We're laying the groundwork for the battle, but it's very important for us to realize we're talking about the same tools right now. Each soul has the same tools. And it's also important because if not, then what do you want from the animal soul? If you give an animal soul seven emotive faculties without the three cognitive faculties, then what do you want from it? How can you expect it to be anything other than, now think of emotions, an emotive locomotive. How can you expect it to be anything else? You know, that's like, when you speak about Billum, we you know the story of Billum, he's talking to his donkey and he comes across kind of a little bit as a fool with all of it. But if you think back, a lot of Mepharshim say that Billum was one of Paro's advisors in Egypt. Basically, we're going to outsmart the Jewish people. Jewish people are reproducing too much. We can't just have a genocide. We can't just kick them out. We got to do something about them. Who came up with the idea to go, oh, we'll have the workforce. Oh, you know, we'll trick them into slavery. So commentators say that was Billum. So Billum wasn't, wasn't a nobody. And the fact that Balak is going to Bilam is not because he was like, okay, let's see who's available from the prophet. Which cursor have we got available today? He went to the elite of the elite. And part of the thing is that why would God put a Bilam into the world? Because if you're going to go to the nations and say, hey, how come you weren't better than you were? They'd say, what do you mean? You gave the Jewish people a Moses. Of course, they're going to be these great people. You give them a Moses to guide them. We had nobody to guide us. So God gave them the Bilam, someone who could have been a very great man. And he was a great man in the negative sense. Look at what they did with him. Look what he did with himself. So he was someone with, with a tremendous potential to bless, to curse. At the end of the day, he did come up with the plan to get the Jewish people to sin. Zimri and, and Cosby and it led to all that. So he wasn't just a whatever. And this is the path they chose to go down. The point here is that Zelma says that God did create a balance to the world. Part of that is also that holiness, which is holiness is kind of like a long-term investment. We don't see the automatic benefit of holiness. We don't see the automatic benefit of choosing God versus materiality, not just things that are not allowed, but things that can be temptations and all kind of stuff. That's the second choice. The two pills that were offered. If all that stuff didn't seem to be good, to our eyes, it didn't seem to be good, there's no balance to the world. There's not a real choice there. Obviously, I'm going to choose holiness. Do you want light or do you want thick darkness in which you cannot move? The answer is pretty obvious. Part of free choice is that both seem to be viable options. There's a balance to the world in which indulging in the physical world seems like a real option because there seems to be a real benefit. That benefit is usually more immediate and it's a more visceral benefit. But without it, there would be no choice. It would be so obvious to choose holiness. The animal soul is going to be battling this because it's got the godly soul in its ear telling it, listen, I know you want the cake right now, but it's not worth it. Or it's not worth it to ditch, I don't know, whatever the mitzvah is going to be. In the other classes, I always have to choose a mitzvah that like, everyone can handle. So sometimes we can't talk about Shabbos too much. So we always talk about shotness because no one has a problem talking about shotness. <laughs> so when we talk about mitzvahs, we talk about shotness and use that as a metaphor for whatever mitzvah you kind of have a hard time with it. There has to seem to be like this benefit to it that the godly soul is like, don't do the shotness, don't do the shotness. And the animal soul is like, what's the big deal? It feels nice. One thing that we're also going to lay out here because you're saying, look, if this is the way the animal soul is made, that it's got the intellectual and the emotive faculties a little bit more even handed. Also, how can you expect? it to be anything else you've made it to desire material things how can you expect it to not do that why would you tell it oh look i know you love cake right now you could love god too not the same thing okay cake is delicious 
God, it's not. So why are you pretending like it's the same thing? So here we have Kimit Sein Lefi Erech HaSeichel. The Midos, as in our emotive faculties, they're according to the Seichel. So what do we mean by that? Think about a little kid crying over spilled milk. That's what children cry over. Not only that, they cry over she's sitting in my chair. You know, like it's the same exact chair. Why are you crying? Take this chair. No, I want my chair. Well, you know, they're four years old. That's why they're crying over it. That's why we have the uh, more adult looking person. Who's obviously lost all this hair. <laughs> crying over a broken heart. Children don't cry over broken hearts. They don't get it. Their friend doesn't want to play with them. They just think they're mean. And then four minutes later, they get over it. Adults cry over broken hearts. First of all, they can understand what a broken heart is. The depth of their intellect is much more. Now, what's the difference there? Why is the child crying over a broken heart? Not in a negative way. Because they're children. Children don't have a capacity to understand these things. As we get older and assumedly mature, we take all these emotions that we've already had, things that we'll cry about, things that we love, things that we fear, and we transfer it to assumedly more mature things, more mature emotions. That's part why teenage years are so wacky because our bodies are becoming adults they're like morphing there's a Kafka thing going on there we're morphing into adults the mind the intellect is broadening to become an adult intellect why are teenagers so morbid this is my theory anyways they can finally understand death they can understand permanence of loss Children don't understand it. You tell them, oh, Bubby's in Shemayim now, or whatever. And they're like, okay, Bubby's in Shemayim. I miss you, Bubby. It's very sweet and it's beautiful, but they don't really get it. They don't feel like the gaping emptiness of when something's taken away from them. At the same time, the joy that they feel on something is very different also. When someone really does you a favor, kids don't understand things that are done for them. Can you get me this? Like, oh, look, I bought your present. Yay, thanks so much. And four months later, your present is like broken on the ground. <laughs> yeah, they appreciate it, but they appreciate it in the child capacity. So what happened? Well, we, we matured. Our minds broadened. We took things that we love and we transferred it to something that more befitting an adult. So we can do this in the spiritual. That's the first thing that chapter six is telling us. The fact that we have a capacity for loving things, the fact that we have this capacity to fill in all the other emotions there, we could take that and we could go beyond it. I call it, you gotta finish the sentence. Everyone likes to say, oh, let my people go. But they don't finish a sentence of, so they may serve me. That's the end of the sentence. Or like, tikkun olam, tikkun olam. But yeah, you gotta finish the sentence. So in this way, we gotta finish the sentence. Why do I have a love for something? Why is this something worthy of love? Why is friendship worthy of protection, right? Why is a relationship something that's worth fighting for or a value or something like that? So you go because, you know, life and whatever, but you got to go a step beyond that. Who gave us life and who gave life meaning? Who told us that life is something valuable? It doesn't end at just saying life is valuable. Life is valuable because God gave it value. That's obviously a broad thing, but anything that you could substitute in there, we could do that, especially because we have mature adult intellects. We can go to that one step beyond that. When we say, oh, we can't do this. How am I supposed to find joy in God the way if I join a piece of cake? It's because you have to finish the sentence. You have to go to the next step beyond that. And we have the capacity to do that. Not because it's easy and not because it's not a process that has to occur. It's something we have to train ourselves to think this way, but this is part of what has to go on. And we can do this because our animal soul, the Nevesha Bahamas, the natural soul has all the capacities there has the tools there already. We just need to uh, reconfigure it because the balance is off. I don't remember which Rebbe said it, but it might have been the Rebbe Rosh but I don't remember. One of the Chabad Rebbe's told his son that God did to human beings a great kindness, that he created us to walk on two feet. Animals walk on all fours, so their minds and their hearts are level and they're looking down at the ground. Human beings stand on two feet, our minds are above our hearts and we can look upward. That's what we're trying to aim for over here. We want to look upward. We don't want to be looking down at the ground. We are naturally built the way we are supposed to function with our brains ruling over our hearts. That if our heart is chasing after something, you're going somewhere, the mind's got to kick in and say, wait a second, what are we doing here? Or why are we indulging in something specific? We have to finish the sentence. Now, it also talks about how the world is a balance between Kedusha and Klippa. So the things that are shell and the things that are holy. Why is something holy? You say, this is holy, but why is it holy? It's holy because it actively reveals godliness in the world. So the Torah and mitzvahs, all that kind of stuff, it's a revelation of godliness within the world. It's an active revelation of godliness. I am throwing up the blackout chains, right? I'm pulling them up. The world spiritually is a place where there's a lot of blackout chains. Each time I do a mitzvah, each time I engage in holiness, Torah study, whatever it is, I am opening up the blackout chains. I am actively bringing spiritual light into the world. Now also think about it like with the sun streaming through the window, the sun's always streaming. The sun's always there. We'll kind of skip ahead for a second, which is skipping ahead to many chapters, but it's also toward the end of this chapter. Where does the sun go on a cloudy day? It doesn't go anywhere. There's cloud cover. And you know that because when the airplane breaks through, the sun's there the whole time. There's only two reasons why we don't see the sun. Either something blocks it or we've turned away from it. The sun is always there. It's a very deep metaphor for spirituality and godliness. There's only two ways we don't see God. Something blocks it or we've turned away from it. So godliness, holiness is us opening up the window shades. We're opening up the blinds. Klipa, Sitra Achra specifically, the other side. Why do we call it the other side? Notice we don't use the word evil. Evil is part of it, but we don't use the word evil. This is forbidden to you. Why is it forbidden to us? Because it blocks godliness actively. It's an active blocking of godliness. It's not just that, oh, I didn't reveal it. It's me pulling down the blackout shade. 
Why is this forbidden? Why is that forbidden? Because our spiritual mission, if you want to get it like even bigger than this, we were put into this world and we have one job. Each of us have our own personal missions to do, but in the global aspect of things, we've got one job. You came into this world to make this world a home for God. You came into this world to bring godliness into the world. Anything that does not align with that job, anything that does not actively bring godliness into the world, that does not allow godliness to shine through the world, is automatically something that works against it. Or is automatically something that does not allow you to fulfill the job. You got one job. Six, seven, and eight are all gonna cover this and go a little bit more into it. This is kind of introduced here in chapter six. Our purpose is Kedusha, is holiness, bringing light into the world. And anything that does not align with it, that does not actively bring godliness into the world is not a fulfillment of our one job. Oh, even neutral things? Well, technically a neutral thing did not specifically bring godliness into the world. Which just to kind of give a parenthesis here, there's a difference between transgression and temptation. We'll use that here. Transgression, we know, that's a thou shalt not. Okay, you know, you can't argue it. That's what it is. So if you're going to do it, you know that you did it wrong. At least if you're honest. But we know this is a thou shalt not. But why do you care about temptation so much? Why does God care if I have three pieces of cake? Or whatever, where Shatna is. No, wait, Shatna is, is a thou shalt not. Why does God care if I go to a concert, let's say? Okay, we'll go back to the cake. So why does God care if I have three pieces of cake? There is no thou shalt not eat three pieces of cake. Find it. Find it for me in the Torah, thou shalt not eat three pieces of cake. Why do you care? For a very specific reason. When I eat three pieces of cake. I am strengthening my animal soul. And each time I strengthen my animal soul, it makes it harder for me to listen to my godly soul. When it's become time to do a mitzvah, to do something that I don't want to do, do something I'm supposed to do, you know, in a certain kind of way, it's going to be much harder for me to do it. It's just factual. The best example, which I think we kind of gave it already, is what happens when you never tell a kid no? They become a spoiled brat. So what happens when you don't tell your animal soul no? The animal soul becomes a spoiled brat. And it becomes very hard to tell a no, metaphorically. Very good. Yes, we are actually talking about thought also. We're talking about thought, speech, and action. Yes. People don't necessarily like to hear that about thought because my thoughts, technically, they're not harming anybody, so who cares? But you gotta ask yourself, and anybody who's been sunk in a dark place knows this very, very well, dark thoughts are not healthy. They're not gonna help us do what we need to do, and they just, they sink us. We don't want anything to slow down our train of awesome. And if you've ever also just been in kind of a bad mood, we're not gonna go to extreme, but like you kind of been in a bad mood and then someone does something so dumb that makes you laugh, it just breaks you out of your mood. It gets you out of your dark thoughts. And all of a sudden you can like start functioning again. So we see that thought can be very debilitating. You know, when you start thinking about it like that and brought into that, why does it say, Why is Levavchem before Nechem? Third paragraph of Shema. Be'omer, Hashem HaMosh, that everybody saw. Los Asur, don't turn after your hearts and don't turn after your eyes. It's opposite. You say, don't turn after your eyes, don't turn after your heart. is because if your heart wants it, your eyes are going to find it. And then if you're going to start thinking about it and you want to do it, you're going to find a way to get it done. Whatever temptation is. Even to the extent of begging your own case. So yes, thought is involved in this as well because we want to keep our thoughts in a happy... Happy is, is ideal, but we want to keep them at least in a healthy place. Because negative thoughts, bad thoughts, do not lead to good places. And especially if we stew in them long enough, it becomes a swamp. A boggy, murky swamp up in our minds. And we all know that's not a healthy place for us to be. Now, someone, God forbid, is going through something that's a very difficult situation. Sometimes we need guidance to get out of there. There's nothing wrong with needing guidance to get out of the thought or to get out of the place that you're in. The problem is when you don't try to get out of it. It's a very different thing. That leads to not good things. So, yes, we want to get our thought, speech, and action in line. We want to get it in line also with remembering that everything we're doing in the world is for the specific purpose of revealing godliness. You really, really want to think about it, especially if you're someone who believes in God. What do you think you're doing here? We're kind of skipping, but one thing that can never be taken away from us, whatever crummy, sucky situation that God puts us in, and God gets very creative, unfortunately. <laughs> Make a thunderstorm, that's bad enough for us. One thing that can never be taken away from us is the fact that we can fulfill the purpose of creation. No matter what we have or don't have, the fulfillment of creation can never be taken away from us because any time I actively reveal godliness in the world, I finish the sentence. I did what I put here to do. And if maybe God doesn't want me to be able to give money on the hundreds of thousands of dollars right now, that's fine. Look, I gave a dollar to Tzedakah and that was what I could do today. I did it. I brought godliness into the world with this. The Kutzker Rebbe said, where does Hashem dwell? Where can we find God? Anywhere he's permitted to enter. The fact that we might not see godliness is because we haven't let him in. The fact that this doesn't seem like a holy place, we have to let him in. The sun is constant. The sun is always there. So where does the sun enter anywhere you let it come in? So if you're going to throw up the blinds, godliness is going to come into the world. Just to go a little bit further into Sitracha, Klipa, and Kedusha. In 7 and 8, we're going to go a little bit more into it and kind of look at it a little bit deeper. So Kedusha, we know, this is the revelation of godliness. It's an extension to dwell in God's holiness. Anything that's surrendered to Hashem, as in it's the lessening of the sense of self, it's the lessening of the material self, the physical self. Anything that says God's will is my will, a surrender to God is a place of holiness or a person of holiness, or anything like that. The holiness receives what we call the inner part of God is where it receives life from. It's something that comes from God's core, whatever that means, from the more inner essence of God. 
klipa, which is the shell of the peel. So are our thoughts, speech, or actions? Are they kedusha? Are they sitracha? Well, in the animal soul, they hang out in the klipa section, usually. And then according to how we use it, they either become holy or we drag them down a little bit. What's very interesting about this chapter is that here we have any action that's not specifically dedicated to God, even if it's not inherently evil, either becomes klipa or sitracha. That would be anything neutral. I did something that was neutral. I went to work today. Well, did you go to work because I got to earn money to support myself or whatever and give to duck and you go to work because people go to work. What's the difference? Who cares? Well, because you have to finish the sentence. I went to work because this is the way that God set up the world and because ultimately the money is going to be used for tzedakah. The money is going to be used for supporting the family, parnasa, which supporting, which is a mitzvah, or this, that, whatever. Now we've elevated to Kedusha. Now we've fulfilled our role in creation. If we don't do that, we're still hanging out in the klipa zone. The thing about klipa is that we can retroactively elevate it, but once it's in sitrach, or that's something that's much... It can't necessarily be elevated because it's gone into forbidden, darkened territory. So that's the next chapter. That's a very interesting thing. Basically, the trick is like this. Let's say you're craving ice cream, okay? People, I've heard people crave ice cream. And you want to have it. So you sit down, you have your massive ice cream, and you put 47 toppings on it. Now, you've just indulged yourself, which Tanya says don't indulge. The trick is, now you have to say some tehillin. Or go to Dava Mincha after that. See, I'm using the energy for holy purposes. I don't know if it really works like that, but I think it's a good mindset to have anyways. So anytime you want to cheat a little bit or eat something that you probably don't indulge, make sure you do something holy afterwards so you can kind of like, write, oh, no, look, I need to eat chocolate so I can Dava Mincha. Look, if nothing else, it keeps our minds in the right places. I'm not a post But I think it's not a bad strategy, okay? At the least, it keeps, again, it keeps us in the right frame of mind. But anyways, the point is, anything that's not specifically for God, and doing this for God, does not enter the realm of Kedusha. It stays down in Klippa, or if it's used for not good, it goes to Sitracha. It's different than saying that, oh, either you do good or bad. Created this new zone where it's every single action we do is supposed to be with the intent of serving God. It's supposed to be with the intent of fulfilling our divine purpose. Exercising and eating healthy is because my body needs to be healthy to do what it's got to do in this world. Having a bunch of friends over, I'm going to celebrate Achanas Asarachim. That's a mitzvah. That's what we want to try to do. That's what our intent is. We got to get our animal soul on board with this. We want to try to direct it in this regard. Because the nefesh al kiss, the thought, speech, and action, they're wrapped up in Torah mitzvahs. They're not the ones that need to be persuaded. It's the animal soul that needs persuasion. To say, hey, we don't just do things. Now, if you want to really mess yourself up, I mean, no, 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 no. If you want to really straighten yourself out, it's everything that you do. If you really ask yourself, why am I doing this right now? What is the purpose of why am I doing this right now? Is there some benefit that's going to come out of this? Something good? Am I killing time? Why am I actually doing this right now? If you have to have your spa day, go on your spa day. But I'm having a spa day because I got to reset myself. I got to refocus. I'm under a lot of stress. I'm going to let it all go. And then I'll be a much happier person to be able to do my Torah mitzvahs. <laughs> okay, no one talks like that, which is pretty true. Still, it reorients us. It reminds us that we're not just here. God does not confetti creation. Oh, this hill needed a cow. Let's put one there. We're here for a reason. And everything in our lives is because we each have a different way of fulfilling that reason. So anyways, Sitra Achra is a self-styled separate being. It's a little bit arrogant. Why is that? Because notice it doesn't say denial of God. Sitra Achra is not a denial of God. Things that are the other side. It's a denial of the fact that everything is for God. It's a denial of the fact that God has direct control over my life. So I was trying to explain to you, like, God wants you to do Torah mitzvahs and he also wants you to live a good life. What is that even supposed to mean? It's not two separate things. Torah and mitzvahs for a Jewish person is a good life. A good life is a life of Torah and mitzvahs. Who defines a good life? Who defines? Torah and mitzvahs tell us what a good life is, as far as have I lived properly. Not me, but I decide what a good life is. That's very subjective. Who made me boss? Well, me. It's a very specific thing that we're doing here is that Sitra Acha, it's not a denial of God, it's a denial of God's specificity. Well, it's, it's a denial of Ashkacha Pratis, more of a clockmaker theory, the watchmaker, right? God created the world, step back from it. Oh, God's there, he exists somewhere but he has nothing to do with me. That's why it's a self-styled separate being, as if I could ever exist without God. It receives, its life force comes from that means behind the back, like the hind part. It gets it from like the edges, part of the whole parasite thing. Yeah, I think we talked about that. It's a parasite, it feeds off the edges. God does not directly give it life force from his innermost self, because God doesn't really want it to be there, but it has to be there to create the balance in the world. How can that occur? If you're telling me that these negative things, the sitra achra, are part of the godness, how can that be? How can something evil be part of the godness? When Hasidism first started, and especially if Chabad Hasidism first started, there were, also, there were a lot of people who were very opposed to it. Whatever a different reason, it was pretty heated. The argument between a Hasid and someone who's opposed to it, so someone who's misnagated. Is God everywhere in the world? Is God in the bathroom? So how can you say God's in the bathroom? If God can't be in the bathroom, the Hasid would be like, how can you say there's any in the world where God doesn't exist? God is everywhere, even in the bathroom. Hasidim think that God is in the bathroom. That was part of the campaign against them. Now you realize in a way why both sides would think like that. But we are very into that. Yeah, God is ever. How can God be something something evil? How can we, God be something that's a, God's in pork? How can you say that? How can you say that God isn't anywhere? 
Well, that's the rebuttal to it. So what happens? We have what's called tsimtsumin. Tsimtsumin is a contraction. God has this great divine light and it gets contracted, 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 small, tight, 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 tiny, till it seems like it's not there anymore. Till it seems not visible. There's a lot of descents. There's a cause and effect. There's a lot of different stuff that goes on. We're not going to get to all of it now. There's a lot, a lot of levels that it goes through until it seems to not exist anymore. There's a lot of veilings that occur. And that is how it can give life force to all these negative things. Because especially Chabad Chassidus is very, very, very into there cannot be anything in the world without God. Then you're saying that there could be something that's not God. And how can you say that? Contracts until it's dim enough to vitalize an object. So because God doesn't really want to be in this negative thing, and because the negative thing has to seem negative to our physical eyes, that's what its role in the world is. And it, it's so contracted, it seems godliness is not even there. The object, or whatever the negative thing is, it masters the divine light, so it's considered an exile, like a captor and a slave. It's not being dragged along to wherever the negative things is. So when we transgress, we're contributing to the captor and the slave situation. Wait until we get into the chapters that really go into transgression. Those are so much fun. Well, they're terrible, to be honest. Unfortunately, if someone transgresses, they're putting on more shackles. Now, there are certain things which are they're beyond our redemption at our level. And how do we know? Because, well, it's forbidden to you. Fork, forbidden to you. Why is it forbidden to you? Because our godly mission here in the world right now, we cannot elevate it. When Mashiach comes, it will be kosher. Mashiach is a very, very different level. That's why this world is a world of so much darkness. Even though it seems that there's supposed to be a balance of Kedusha and Klippa, realistically speaking, Klippa and Sitrach are dominated in this physical world. Because of all the contractions that occurred, because godliness is not so visible in this world, and even on a sunny day, the sun, as in the godly light, is we don't see it. That's why this world is a world of much spiritual darkness. And that's why the word olam means world. It comes with the word of helen. The word of helen, which means hidden. Which, to be frank, because godliness is so hidden in the world, that's why so many things suck. And I have a very poetic way of saying things. Because if we could actually see the light, either we'd understand certain things that occur, or there wouldn't be certain kind of darknesses in the world. Because darkness cannot exist where there is light. It is actually impossible for darkness to exist where there is light. When you have your flashlight in the darkness, there cannot be darkness within the reach of that light. It is actually impossible. You don't remove darkness. You don't have to kick it. You don't have to sweep it away. You need light. Light is what removes darkness. Like, oh, what about a shadow? Well, a shadow means that something blocked the light, doesn't it? We know that Hashem has different names. Some of this is kind of sidetracking, but it all fits into this chapter. We know Hashem has different names, and those different names that we use tap into different aspects of our relationship with God. Sometimes we call God the master of the world, Adon Alam. That's what we're focusing on there. The name of Aleph Lamed, the Yudgimel Midas Arachamim, that's Hashem Hashem Kel, Racham Vachanan. We have the names of Havaya, that's the Yud and the Hey, and then above it, Hey. We call it Shem Havaya. That is the part of God of creation, goodness within creation. And then we have the name of Elohim, gracious bar Elohim. As our Shemayim Bresa arts. Elokim is Gematria of nature. The name of Elokim is a name of judgment. It's a name of restriction. God created the world of the name of Aya, and it's, it's too much. It's too bright. So then we have the name of Elokim, aka nature, which shrouds over the name of Havaya. When we look at the world and we say, oh, it's working according to nature? Who set the rules for nature? Nature is what we understand as the rule for the functioning of the world. But that's the name of Elokim. That is how God sets out rules for creation, is that he functions through the name of Elokim. And that's a constricting of a godly life. That's what we call it nature. We don't say, oh, here's God. We say, oh, that's nature. Technically, what happens is that when there's a miracle, especially a miracle that we see, or if you think we see moments of Ashkach Pratis, that's a moment when the name of Elkim has kind of opened up so we can see Havaya shining in the world. We can see the actual truth of what the world is, that the, of a name of Havaya. It's a much more expansive and goodness. Um, okay, I think we did the last part here. It just tells us that there's two levels of Klippa. We have what's called Klippa Snoga. Klippa Snoga is the gray zone. When we talk about Klippa Snoga, that's like the middle part where it's like anything that's permissible or mundane, any of the regular, the neutral stuff that we do, that's called, that's really more referred to Klippa Snoga. And then there's Shalish Klippa Satamias, the three completely impure Klippa. That falls into Sitra Achra. If you would see it in the text, you'd see that Tanya uses, specifies, according to what it's talking about, Klippa Snoga, which is neutral, the gray zone, or Shalish Klippa Satamias, which is anything that's forbidden, thought, speech, and action, it's completely unclean and evil and has no good whatsoever. Shalash Klippas Atomeos are things that cannot be elevated. Klippas Noga are things that can be elevated according to how we use it. The Alter Rebbe Sassidim used to say that what's forbidden is forbidden, what's permissible is unnecessary. But I always say, well, just because you're allowed to do it, if you indulge in it, what are you doing it for? So if you're just indulging yourself, you don't go, because I want to, you're feeding your animal soul. What happens when you don't tell your animal soul no? It gets harder to tell a no when it matters. And think of it like you're, you're adding more rocks. So that it's harder to, to defy gravity. Cue the song. You can't defy gravity if you have too many rocks in your pocket. You have to have things that are going to raise you up. So each time you're going to give into temptation, even if it's not specific to transgression, you're just adding more rocks to the gravity belt. So that's why even just because it's permissible, doesn't mean you have to do it. And if you are going to do it, you have to figure why you're doing it. If it is a sense, then you'll know if you should be engaging that behavior. That's chapter six, which sets us up now for the next two chapters where we're going to go more into all the parts of the animal soul and Klippa and Sidrachra. And then we can finally get to chapter nine, which tells us now what happens when we put the godless on the animal soul, they get pitted against each other.